Um, thank you for having me. And this is the most exciting venue I've ever <laughs> spoken at, I think. So if you get bored of <laughs> hearing about the Aspen Archives, uh, there's a lot of amazing activity going on behind me. Uh, my name is Allison Krogel, and I am a professor at the University of Denver. And uh, I am a Latin American specialist. Um, particularly, I teach about uh, the Andes, Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, literature and uh, art courses and history courses about that region of the world. And I think um, as I speak with you today, you'll begin to understand a little bit about uh, how the Andes uh, relates to Route County. Um, so I'm going to set my timer here <laughs> to make sure I don't speak more than uh, my allowed time. And I'd be happy to answer questions at the end um, of the presentation because there's no way that I'll be able to uh, get to everything. So today I'm gonna give you an overview about a project that is a, a long, lengthy project that involves a lot of collaborators in many countries and many uh, disciplines. And I'm just gonna sort of give you an overview. There are uh, lots of details in the museum exhibit just to get an idea that, how many folks have seen the museum exhibit, the Aspen Archives? Oh, wow, okay. So many of you already know a lot about this, um, and those of you who are very familiar with the history of Colorado and Northwest Colorado in particular are going to know a lot of the information that I'm gonna to mention today. Um, and I also wanted to uh, point out that anything that I say today, you can also look up in more detail and see the images in more detail, the historical maps, historical photographs, or if you want to learn the entire bit of uh, information today in Spanish instead of English, you can also go to uh, theaspenarchives.org and we also have um, some Quechua language material on the um, digital exhibition. Uh, which is the most commonly spoken indigenous language in the Americas and is the language spoken by many of the sheep herders working in the United States today. So, with that said, um, the idea of this project, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, is to contextualize the socio-cultural, uh, historical, and political references alluded to in Aspen Arborglyph carvings that we find in Route County. So um, I sort of cut it off at 1925 because I was focusing mostly on Northern Route County and the um, slides that were taken by the amateur uh, photographer and citizen scientist Mark Chapman, who was a longtime resident of Steamboat Springs. Maybe some of you uh, know Mark Chapman. He documented hundreds of Aspen carvings from about 1970 to 1995. And then um, this was kind of my pandemic project because I usually work in the Andes during the, uh, the chunk of the year. And during the pandemic, I spent my time in North Route County. Uh, so I added several hundred more uh, Arborglyph images to the collection and that's sort of what we were working with. And we didn't find any uh, carvings earlier than 1925. So that's sort of the uh, time period that we're looking at here. Um, and the more I dug, the more questions I found, and I started going in many different directions, and the project expanded in many different directions. So um, I wanted to give a shout out to another Steamboat resident, Keelan Vargas, uh, who was a student at the University of Denver when I started on this project, and she graduated from high school here in Steamboat and went on to study geographic information systems, geography at the University of Denver. So all of the maps that you saw um, in the museum exhibit were created by Keelan, the physical maps, and the maps that you'll see some of uh, uh, today in the presentation, and also the website was designed by uh, Keelan Vargas, and she did the digital maps. So if you're really into Aspen carvings, there are many, many, many interactive features on the website that I'm not gonna get into today, but you can do all sorts of things um, Keelan became as obsessed with this project as I do, I think. And so you can filter by home country of the sheep herder, the, the years of the carvings, the region of the forest where they might be found. Uh, so you can play with the um, digital maps 
uh, a lot if you go to uh, the aspenarchives.org. So with that being said, um, this is kind of um, some of the high points, I guess, that uh, we focused on in this exhibit. And I'm not gonna go through all of these uh, sections in detail because I only have um, uh, a bit of time today, but you can explore any of these topics in, in detail in the exhibit in the museum or on the website. Um, so I'm gonna just start with sort of historical and geographic context here. Basically the question is why do we find names and dates and hometowns of sheep herders so, so, so many from New Mexico, particularly northern New Mexico when we're talking about Route County. Um, lots of folks uh, who are familiar with the history of sheep herding in the United States think of Basque sheep herders. Uh, and we don't find a lot of Basque last names or hometowns in northwest Colorado. So this project is kind of explaining why so many uh, connections to New Mexico and why beginning in the 1980s do we almost exclusively find hometowns uh, from central Peruvian highlands uh, when we're talking about Aspen carvings and sheep herders working in not only uh, Northwest Colorado, not only Colorado, but um, all the United States. Almost all of the uh, several thousand sheep herders working in the United States today are almost exclusively from uh, Peru. A handful uh, from other regions of the world, but um, by and large from, from the central Peruvian highlands. So a little bit of um, historical context here. Um, Sheep. <laughs> sheep uh, are not native to the Americas, of course. They are. Um, they they came to the Americas uh, with the Spanish conquistador in the um, in the 16th century. And the first time that uh, sheep enter into the present day United States is it in, it's it's very early, 1540s, right? So if any of you remember Francisco de Coronado. Uh, one of many conquistadors looking for golden cities, um, constantly looking for El Dorado everywhere, constantly looking for uh, La Ciudad de Cibola, uh, the golden cities of Cibola, and so Coronado was looking for the, some golden cities in present-day New Mexico and Arizona in the 1540s, and it was, it was very common on these expeditions to take thousands of sheep and other pack animals, not only um, to eat along the way, but uh, the idea was to also try to introduce them into different areas so subsequent explorers or conquistadores could, um, could uh, have food uh, along, along the way. So the Coronado's introduction of sheep didn't stick, so to speak. Um, the Spanish, uh, in the 16th, 17th, 15th century even, were very, very detailed uh, in their chronicles and their account books. So we know exactly how many mares, exactly how many sheep, um, et cetera, were taken, taken on, this, on this journey. And we also know that nearly all of the flocks in this case died of, um, of exposure, of dehydration, or were consumed, were eaten by, um, by the conquistadores. So it's really not until 1598 that, um, so almost the 1600s, when you have really um, a permanent introduction of sheep into what is today the uh, United States. And we're talking here about New, uh, New Mexico, uh, what is today New Mexico, um, and which was uh, back in the 1598 or the 1600s, part of uh, the Viceroyalty of New Spain, right? Uh, so this was Spanish territory and then independent Mexican territory and only later uh, territory of the present day United States. So in this map that you can see in much more detail in the museum, um, Keelan has created um, a map that shows us about this very, very long um, uh, trail from present-day Mexico City, which was uh, the capital of the Viceroyalty of New Spain, all the way to a little bit north of what is today Santa Fe, right? So this was a super important commercial route from uh, 1598 up until the mid-1800s. Very, very important route. If you've, any of you have gone to um, uh, northern New Mexico, you can uh, see all sorts of uh, historical documentation and you can walk sections of this 
of this route. And this is how sheep were entering into the present day United States for hundreds of years. Um, and in the museum exhibit, you can see some of the Aspen carvings, a lot of Aspen carvings from this region of northern New Mexico where sheep were first introduced. And so this is one of the areas in the United States where there are hundreds of years of, um, of practices related to ovine husbandry. Um, okay, mass, okay, mass. Okay, um, <laughs> these maps don't show up so well uh, on the projector, but you can check them out on the website or in the museum exhibit. But the idea of this map was really to sort of uh, create a visual representation of all of these shifting borders of Col Colorado and the territorial west in the mid-1800s, and to sort of highlight that with the uh, California gold rush, you have another huge movement of sheep. So if any of you have been to Northern California, Fresno area, Sacramento area, you know that there are a lot of sheep in this region as well. And uh, they first arrived there with the uh, California gold rush starting around 1848. Um, this is a massive new market for mutton, for wool, and you have uh, people like Kit Carson making fortunes driving uh, thousands of sheep from New Mexico all the way to present-day Sacramento and to the gold fields uh, to sell these sheep which were very, very valuable uh, at the time uh, for mutton and also for wool. And then, of course, uh, you all know uh, very well if you grew up in Colorado or you're just interested in Colorado history, all about the uh, history of mining booms in Colorado. So you can't see it here, but all of these points in uh, the Colorado Territory there are uh, dated so you can see when a particular city had its mining boom and at that point you'll find thousands of sheep showing up right um, to feed the miners and um, most, mostly for, for mutton. Uh, interestingly the sheep in Northwest Colorado mostly um, arrived not through New Mexico trailing north uh, into Colorado, but rather uh, through, uh, through Wyoming. So dro dropping down through what we, what we refer to as the, the Red Desert, right? Um, so, so they're not coming sort of north, yeah, they're not coming uh, north through, through New Mexico, but they're, most of them are coming across through Wyoming from California, being trailed across Utah, Wyoming, and then dipping down into, um, into Northwest uh, Colorado. And interestingly, um, interestingly, uh, it, it's really the high altitude pastures that you all have here in Route County that really excites uh, the ranchers because this is lots of excellent feed uh, that is available during several months of the year and as long as you're able to move uh, move the, the herds um, down valley the, in the, uh, you're, uh, during the winter season you're able to have a lot of feed uh, for many months of the year. So that's a little bit of, of um, sheep <laughs> history uh, when we're thinking about this area of the world. These are some of the earliest images that I found of uh, sheep, ovine husbandry or, or sheep um, husbandry in the, in the present day United States. And these are from the Palace of the Governor's photo archives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And these are Diné or Navajo women uh, working with flocks of sheep. This, these um, Images are from, yeah, 1915. So very early, hand-colored lantern slides, they're called. Um, and so if the colors look a little unusual, it's because they would be hand-painted hand, um, uh, with the technology of the day. Um, all right, let's see. So much information. OK. Um, so. Another section of the museum exhibit that you can see in more detail at uh, the Trident Pioneers Museum is this question of railway corridors. So I started to find out, again, I'm coming from this, let me just step back a second and say, I'm coming from this as a, a specialist in Andean 
Quechua Peruvian culture, and not as a historian of Colorado. <laughs> um, so that I discovered a lot, and I didn't grow up in Colorado, so I discovered a lot of things as I was trying to figure out more about the Peruvian presence uh, in the Rocky Mountain West. And one of the things that I thought was so fascinating was whoever got the railhead, it was this huge economic boon, right, for the, for the local community. And if you didn't have to trail your sheep to a faraway railhead, this was a, a, a very important uh, economic win for your, for your town. Um, as you're all quite familiar, the geography, uh, topography in this part of the world is very complicated. So relatively speaking, uh, Steamboat and Hayden and Craig don't receive a railheads until quite late in the, in the railway boom, right? So it's 1908 for Steamboat and 1913 for Hayden and Craig. I liked this image from 1915 that I found in the Tread of Pioneers uh, photo archives, and it's entitled Depot and Sheep, Lambs Belonging to Boyer Brothers of Rock Springs, Wyoming, Awaiting Shipment to Market at Steamboat Springs. So here um, you have a herder with hundreds, probably more than a thousand sheep waiting, waiting for shipment. Um, so um, in this image that I found uh, at the Museum of Northwest Colorado in their photo archive, uh, this one is entitled Grading the Craig Yards in Anticipation of the Arrival of the Railway in 1913. Um, when the, when the rail arrives in Hayden and Craig, this is unbelievably important for this uh, area of Northwest Colorado where they um, really focused on sheep, on sheep husbandry. Um, and it leads to, in the early 20th century, Hayden being um, documented as the, is the town with most sheep being exported from Hayden um, of, any, of any town or city in the United States. Um, and that, was, I have the date here somewhere, I want to say it's like 1920. Um, and if you're interested in, in this history, uh, you can check out the website and also if you see the headphones in the museum exhibit, you can hear some oral histories of residents of Northwest Colorado talking about memories, family memories of when the railway arrived. Uh, so I, our team edited uh, this oral history uh, from a uh, Craig resident, Bonnie, uh, Bonnie Villar, who talks about when uh, rail, the railway arrived in Craig and what that meant for the, for the community. Um, and then just a shout out to one of my colleagues, maybe some of you know his work, Dr. Andrew Gulliford, um, who is a historian of, of Colorado. If you're interested in this history of railway and economic development in Colorado, um, he, and if you're really interested in sheep, <laughs> uh, his, he has a whole book on this, uh, like over 300 pages of very detailed information about the history of what he calls sheepscapes in Colorado in particular, and it's called the Woolly West, and it has a lot of great images. Um, and we link to some of um, his presentations and interviews on our website as well, if you're interested. He's interested in Aspen carvings as well. Um, okay, so we can't really talk about sheep in Northwest Colorado without talking about the so-called cattle and sheep wars, right? Um, so this became interesting to me because I was realizing that I love maps, if you can't tell. <laughs> um, even though I'm not a cartographer or a geographer, I love maps. And the more that I was looking at historic maps, contemporary maps, new U.S. Forest Service applications that you can use to zoom in, I was finding that um, clusters of asking carvings were uh, located along historic sheep driveways, right? So then I started thinking, all right, let's talk more about, let me, let me find out more. It's the pandemic. I'm just sitting in my house with hundreds and hundreds of books. Uh, let's read more about uh, historic sheep driveways. So I did. <laughs> And, and I found out this fascinating, how it links to the cattle and sheep wars and this question of how can we make sure that the cattlemen take their herds at a particular, they, they take their animals at a particular time of year, particular dates down to the hour, 
right? Um, into, into grazing areas, and how do we, most importantly, for, for Route County in particular, because the ranchers were very concerned about sheep getting on, grazing on cattle land, right? How do we then get the sheep up to those high mountain pastures without having them um, grazing on any of the, of the land that it was designated for cattle? Um, and it makes sense then that you would have more aspen carvings close to these historic driveways, right? Because that's where you have um, the herders taking thousands of sheep and waiting for them to graze, right? Um, so, uh, in terms of the cattle and sheep wars, we're talking here about late 19th and early 20th century Colorado uh, with cattle and sheep ranchers competing for public range and local skirmishes turning violent. Um, I also became obsessed with this uh, database of historic newspapers. I have to say, like I've worked with a lot of states and countries' uh, historic newspaper collections, and Colorado's is like top notch. You can search, you can search for very specific key phrases. The scans are all very well done. Um, you have an unbelievable resource in this state with historic newspapers. So I found that Craig had loads of newspapers in the late 19th century, early 20th century, lots of them, um, and that lots of the news in the, in the 1890s and 1910s and even into the 1920s had to do with sheep wars, troublesome sheep. Um, so here, here are a few titles, Those Troublesome Sheep, Sheep War Started. If you go on the website, you can zoom in and read some of the, some of the text. Um, here's an article from the Route County Courier from 1907, Are Sheep to Bleat in Route County? Uh, Route was very concerned about sheep. Um, and and there, was a, there was a lot of um, insults going back and forth um, in, this, in this time period. Which, um, which oftentimes led to uh, fatal, fatal encounters, right? Um, and then, interestingly, I thought, um, you can see sort of these so-called deadlines in the press where um, along the Wyoming border, right, uh, north, north of here, where the understanding was, and I'm quoting here from an article in 1929, Quote, sheep that crossed the line would be killed. This is the understanding that all cattlemen and sheepmen have, right? Um, and then a lengthier quote here from this Pantograph article from 1891 is, quote, the cattlemen are firm in their determination to allow no sheepmen to enter this section of the country. And they say if the sheepmen cannot be persuaded to leave the country peaceably, they will be driven back or other measures resorted to. It is true that one man has as much right to the range as another, but sheep are not content with their rights. They take everything as they go, and it is thus spoiled for the cattle range. The cattlemen come first. Uh, the cattlemen came first into this country, and we owe it to them that this country is built up as it is. Any attempt to encroach upon the rights of the cattlemen would only engender a bitter felling out between the parties concerned, and would in no wise way be productive of any good. End quote. So that's sort of repeated in many, many articles in this, in this time period. Um, you have masked cowboys um, killing sheep and sheep uh, men, sheep herders. Called, they're often called sheep men in the, in the press of the time. Um, and so, and you have this very, uh, where's my, where's my image of the, Oh, this image is from Harper's Weekly, if anybody's a Harper's fan. Uh, this is really early, 1877, and um, it's a drawing by Paul uh, Frenzeni, and it's showing, uh, it's called Sheep Raid in Colorado, and it's a very uh, violent encounter that um, was indeed um, a historical event in the, in the, 18, in the 1870s. Uh, so these cattle and sheep wars were well known across the United States. Something had to be done, and um, a lot of uh, the question of the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, the question of grazing permits, and these sheep driveways I was speaking about earlier comes out of this wish to calm 
the, uh, the violence, right, and the dissension between the ranchers. And some, we, I should say, some ranchers had both sheep and cattle, right? Uh, but then that made things very difficult, or sometimes the economics of sheep was much better, depending on what kind of land you had, right? Um, or what grazing permits later that you had, and the imp interesting thing is that with sheep you get two paychecks, you get the wool check and the meat check, right, the mutton check. So a lot of times it, it might have made more economic sense for your family to, um, to have sheep, to keep sheep, um, but because of these political rivalries and such, um, you might have chosen you might have chosen cattle over sheep. So um, seeking seeking an entente. So in 1905, Theodore Roosevelt established the U.S. Forest Service. Right. Um, a lot of ranchers did not love this because why? Grazing fees. <laughs> Right? So grazing fees began, uh, were then charged to run stock on public land, and then a permit system was established in 1911 uh, with the idea that this would help alleviate some of the conflicts between the cattle and the sheep ranchers. And the United States Forest Service also uh, uh, helped with and spearheaded the construction of these sheep driveways, right? Uh, so, yeah, so that's not until 1911. And I know a lot of you. Um, know much more than I do about Farrington Carpenter, uh, but I read, I've read a lot about his work in the last few years, and of course he uh, played a pivotal role in, in drafting the Taylor Grazing Act, right, in 1934, and creating grazing districts across the West, and it's really genius if you go into the details of how Farrington Carpenter worked out these, who, who grazes where at what time, and making everybody sort of come together around the table in a way that like I think that a lot of our political leaders at the national and even state level could learn a lot from <laughs> from how people just got along in the 1930s um, but in any case the Bureau, the grazing service which later becomes the Bureau of Land Management uh, began to negotiate these protocols that would try to curb overgrazing and deterioration of public lands um, and allow both cattle and sheep ranchers access to grazing lands um, in a more uh, peaceful manner. So this image you can see in the museum and also on the website. Um, this is um, a photograph of a map that I found um, in the Museum of Northwest Colorado in Craig. And it's a leather map. So if you're a map, junkie like me, this one was super cool. It's huge. <laughs> like this? It's like very large. So um, I, the photographer I was working with, I said, we must have this, we must have this. And it was in an attic in the museum. So he was up on a ladder taking a picture, uh, a, you know, a high fidelity image of this so that we can include it in the exhibit. But it's leather so that it, and it's, if you fold it, it fits perfectly in a saddlebag because this would have been what the uh, sheep herder needed to take in the saddle to make sure he wasn't letting thousands of sheep graze on somebody else's land, right? This was uh, perhaps a question of life and death, whether or not he put, you know, let the sheep out on the correct color. So each of these colors is a family's holding, and this historic map, you can pick, there's like a tissue layer where they've made amendments and changes, and in particular, this is a very important part of Northwest Colorado history. This is Browns Park specifically here. And this is an area uh, which receives less precipitation and uh, snowfall than many other areas of Northwest Colorado. So it's a good place to winter your sheep. So even today, a lot of the Peruvian uh, sheep herders who I'm in contact with send me, we have like WhatsApp, you know, chats. And they're like, off to Browns Park again, Professor Allison. And, and that's because they're still trailing from Craig to Browns Park, thousands and thousands of sheep um, every, I, it's usually between October and November, depending on a lot of things. But um, so a lot of the herders are still, uh, to, to this day, um, uh, using this area and a lot of the ranchers to, to overwinter to overwinter their flocks. So this is, brings us to, oh, and I love this image, this is from 1931, from, again, the courtesy of the Museum of Northwest Colorado. This is, it's hard to make out this image, but um, it's a wagon bridge. 
So before there was a bridge over the Snake River, you would put abut the wagons one after the next, and then the sheep are crossing over the wagons here, and it's Robert R. Duke leads sheep across the Snake River on a bridge fashioned from wagons and planks towards winter pastures near Browns Park. Uh, yeah, and in the Bonnie B. Yard uh, oral history that I have on the website and that you can hear on the headphones in the museum, she talks about um, this whole process that her family would do um, when she was a little girl. Yeah, so this one was really interesting. Uh, and incidentally, this is a technique used in Peru as well. Um, still today, there are a lot of places, as you know, uh, rivers are tricky. <laughs> So they might be in a different place next year, so it doesn't make sense to build a permanent bridge oftentimes. So this technique is used in, I've seen it in Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru. Okay, so, um, ah, I have 15 minutes. All right, I'm gonna go fast. So, uh, transhumans as cultural and economic heritage. So I think something important I, uh, to mention is that in the Rocky Mountain West, you have this hundred year uh, plus uh, cultural practice of moving the animals with the seasons, right? And that's what transhumancia or transhumans uh, means. There are very few places in Europe and the Americas where this is still practiced for a lot of reasons, fences being one of them. But the idea is that you're moving the animals with the season and uh, this requires, of course, their human tenders to move with them. Um, UNESCO has actually um, honored different cultures in Italy and other parts of uh, Greece, other parts of Europe for their long-standing tradition of moving flocks up into mountain pastures in the summer and back down into the valleys in the winter. I haven't seen that this has been honored in uh, the United States, but it's a fascinating practice. Um, it requires, of course, different um, shelter for the herders depending on the time of the year. So in Colorado, what I've mostly seen, so I've been working with sheep herders for about 20, let's see, we're in 2023 now. I just wrote 2022 on a document today. And the guy's like, no, we're in 2023. Uh, so uh, since about, for 23 years then, I've been working with sheep herders, mostly in, um, Always, almost always Peruvian sheep herders in uh, Idaho and Wyoming is where I started working, and then some in Nevada. Colorado is the first place I've seen these sheep wagons or trailers um, pulled almost exclusively with uh, trucks. Your roads are much better here than in a lot of places in uh, Idaho, your forest service roads, um, than they are in other places where still today uh, the sheep wagons are pulled by horses um, when, when, the, when the flocks need to graze elsewhere, right? So um, they don't look so much different than early, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, they're no longer on wooden wheels. Um, and oftentimes, in, like I said, in Colorado, they're pulled by trucks instead of, instead of horses. But these tend to be the uh, winter quarters. So for example, in Browns Park right now, this would be the winter the winter quarters, and then somewhere up oh, here, I don't know if you can see it, these big canvas tents, um, which look very much like, like World War II tents. I have to say, my family tent continues to be a tent that looks just like this, because my dad always said, why would we buy one of these ridiculous REI tents when your grandfather gave me his 1935 canvas tent that you can stand in, and we would carry it, you know, Thing. Um, but they look quite, so when I saw this first herder tent um, in Wyoming, probably around 2001, I said, oh, I know these tents. You know, they're very big tents, and they're, um, you can move them on, on horseback. So in a lot of places in Wyoming, Idaho, and um, Nevada, the herders sleep in these tents during the summer, during the summer months. Um, so I promised you I would talk to you about the herders, and I haven't even gotten to the arbor glyphs yet, and I have 10 minutes left. But why, uh, what's the New Mexico connection and what's the Peruvian connection to Route County? So we talked a little bit about how sheep were first um, introduced into the present day United States in what is today New Mexico. Um, so 
So hundreds of years of expertise in New Mexico with, um, with sheep, particularly in, if, you, if you pay attention to aspen carvings, uh, in particular, I'm most familiar with North Route County, um, in the, around the Elkhorn uh, <coughs> sheep driveway, the Elkhorn um, driveway is where I did a lot of this documentation. Um, and Mark Chapman did some more, more, more photographic documentation than I did in other parts of that county. But almost always you'll find uh, that the herders came from northern New Mexico when it's a New Mexico carving. And it's a few, um, a few particular Colfax County, Mora County, Rio Arriba, sometimes you say uh, Rancho de Taos or Taos in the, in the inscriptions. Um, the first generations of sheep herders in Colorado um, often came, they were often immigrants from Europe, um, so some ba Basques uh, from Spain and France. Um, also, of course, in Northwest Colorado, a lot of immigrants from Greece, some from Scotland, England. Um, oftentimes, the sheep uh, herders first came to work in mines, and um, that seemed to be particularly the case with a lot of the uh, Greek ranching families who often went first to around Price, Utah, was what, uh, what came up a lot uh, in the research. But it doesn't seem that so many herders from the Basque region of Spain and France came to this part of the United States. Um, when I've worked in forests in Nevada, it's almost all Basque last names, for example, in Idaho as well, Southern Idaho, almost exclusively Basque last names in the 1930s, 40s. Um, and here, as early as the 1940s, you're finding l so many um, New Mexico hometowns. Um, and almost all of, by the 1940s, you have uh, 1940s, 1950s, the vast majority of the inscriptions are in Spanish. Um, even though the first, like 1920s and 1930s and the early 1940s, they tend to be in, in English in this part of the country. Um, so why, why this shift in labor? Um, in the 1930s and, and 40s, New Mexico, um, there, there starts to be more restrictions on grazing lands in Highland, New Mexico, so there's more pressure on these small family farms, probably fewer opportunities for ranches that don't have thousands and tens of thousands of sheep, right? So there's more sort of migrant labor um, from small family farms up uh, to other areas um, of, of Colorado or other parts of the United States. Um, and then we could get into a whole interesting textile history, but the advent of nylon affects the, the wool industry in a big way. Um, World War II was actually good for wool because the uniforms had to be uh, US grown wool. And interestingly, I interviewed a lot of, or not a lot, but I, I interviewed some ranching families um, in Moffett County. And just to this day, there's a particular quality of wool that the United States government will only buy this high, high quality wool for the uniforms of soldiers in the United States. And because of the snowfall that you have in this area of the country, it keeps the fleece particularly clean. Um, and so it's a higher quality of wool. You can read all the details in chapter five of the online digital <laughs> exhibit, uh, where there's some interviews with some artisanal wool um, producers from Moffett County at the uh, Yampa Valley Fiber Works. Um, so if you're interested in fiber history, um, there's, you can find it on the, on the website and also in the museum exhibit. So you find a lot of migrant herders um, from New Mexico, northern New Mexico, beginning yeah, in the 1940s. Um, and you can see these carvings a lot of Española, New Mexico, Valdez, New Mexico, that, that tree's from 1927, so that's an earlier one. Um, this is a particular kind of cursive that was taught in primary schools and secondary schools um, in 
in this uh, Spencerian script, it's called, for those of you who are cursive nerds like I am. Uh, <laughs> and it seems to have been taught later in the rural schools when the, the urban school teachers are like, well, too much, too much. Those of you who, who are teachers like me, uh, you see how the, the, the principals tell us, do this, no, don't do that, you know, or the administrators, right? So cursive is good, cursive is bad. You know, this, so this Spencerian script is, is beautiful, and you'll see it in these arbor glyphs in Route County in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and it seems to be that the um, oral histories, too, of some of herders tell us that it was a way to show that you had achieved at least fifth or sixth grade um, in primary school in order to have learned this particular script. Um, and then I, I don't, I haven't found a lot of this script after, say, the 1960s, for example. 1970s to the present, in my remaining six minutes, <laughs> uh, the Central Peruvian connection. So, if you notice the Aspen carvings in the forests in this part of the world, um, beginning particularly in the early um, 1980s, you'll find that there are mostly mentioning hometowns in Peru, and specifically the central area of Peru, the central Peruvian highlands. You can see this map much better in the museum exhibit. But um, the herders are almost exclusively from a few provinces in highland Peru, where there's a hundreds of years of practice of ovine husbandry as well. So these folks are experts in caring for, for sheep. Um, different, uh, different varieties than you, breeds than you have here. Uh, in in um, Route County and Moffat, uh, but but also but they are expert experts in sheep herding. And before the Spanish conquistadors, interestingly, the conquistadors, while they were busy creating all sorts of problems in present-day New Mexico, they were also causing all sorts of problems in Central Peruvian highlands in the 1600s, and also introducing sheep. Um, so before uh, the Spanish. Uh, arrived in present-day Peru in 1532, it would have been alpaca and uh, llama husbandry, right? So these new European animals were introduced, and so a lot of the wool traditions shifted. Um, so nearly all of the sheep herders in working in the United States today are working um, under the auspices of the H-2A um, visa program that's administered by the U.S. Department of Labor. And these are not seasonal visas, they're all year round, right? For three year stints and they're renewable, depending on a lot of complicated um, things. <laughs> but uh, the herders are, yeah, they're working all year round and their visas are tied to one particular employer in most cases. Uh, the images, the photographic images of the herders, most of them, for the, this exhibit were taken by R.J. Sangosti, who's a photojournalist from the Denver Post. So those um, beautiful images that you see in the exhibit that are quite poignant, I think, were taken um, by, by R.J. Sangosti, and um, you can see more of his work in the museum. Um, so, que mas quería decir? The, um, the Peruvian herders begin to come to the United States during a period of Peruvian history that is extremely fraught as the present day political situation in, in Peru right now. Uh, but it was a very, very violent um, civil, civil internal, internal violent struggle uh, where tens of thousands of Peruvians, particularly Peruvians of indigenous descent, were um, killed during Sendero Luminoso, known in English as Shining Path. Um, and particularly in this central Peruvian region. So the region where most of the herders that you'll see working in um, the United States, that, that is where sort of the center of the insurgency was, was focused. So there was a huge migration, out migration, by particularly um, farming and ranching families um, out of the central Peruvian highlands, either to Lima or, or further afield, right? So this is obviously an incredibly difficult job. Um, so there's always the question of why. Uh, and that's one of the, the reasons. It's also one of the regions of Peru um, that is the most socioeconomically disadvantaged, highest levels of, of analfabetismo, of illiteracy, of, um, of you know, nutritional challenges, maternal infant health challenges, high levels of indigenous language speakers, um, Quechua or Quechua speakers, 
Um, and as I said, a rich tradition of of a wine husbandry. So if you're in the forests of, of Route County and you see um, a lot of these place names that are dated in the 1980s, 90s, 2000s, um, and you look them up on your mobile device, you'll find that many of them are from the Central Peruvian Highlands. If you uh, check out our, our digital exhibition, you can listen to um, interviews with retired herders. Here's one with Delio Nicandro Leon Duribilca who spent um, a, many, many years working as a, as a herder in the United States, and we have it dubbed into English, or you can listen to it in Spanish. Um, and he talks about some of the differences he perceives in terms of caring for sheep in the United States as opposed to Peru, and in particular, something that comes up so often when I interview herders is lack of parties for the sheep. <laughs> so in Peru, there are many, many, many celebrations that are specifically for different animals. And so what you, it, uh, this one, for example, uh, uh, Erranza Festival. Erranza is like branding, but the way that the sheep are branded is with these colorful um, woven sort of ribbons on their ears, and that tells you that it comes from a particular family, and that it is a ewe of such and such number of years, and then the lambs are marked in a similar way with a particular combination of colors um, in their ears. And so there's there's a lot of discussion with the herders, telling me like, why don't they do this here? Like, don't they know <laughs> that the sheep behave better if they have parties and celebrations? <laughs> And then, in, I think it's very interesting that there's often a comment that cattle get so much attention, why are the cattle getting all the, you know, obviously the sheep are going to be ill-behaved if you're focusing your agricultural um, and ranching events on, on cattle. So it, you can explore this section of the website, which has some poetry uh, in Quechua that is specifically for sheep, some songs that are sung in during, particularly during breeding season and during this um, branding season, lambing season. There, there are songs for different times of the year and they're basically very respectful songs to the ewes, thanking them for their labor, literally, um, and offering them particular food, beverages, fermented in the in the spirit of the tread of pioneer that, that these would be fermented uh, corn uh, corn beer so it's called chicha or aja in quechua it's called the the animals receive the also partake uh, and then they receive um, necklaces made of particular flowers so there's a lot of discussion with the herders working in the rocky mountain west that um that that the sheep don't receive enough uh admiration and and thanks here um so Please check out the online um, exhibit. I talked too much about the history and not enough about the actual carvings themselves, but the exhibit sort of invites people um, who spend time in the forest or maybe who just want to check out the exhibit in the museum to actually read these trees as uh, documents, uh, historical documents, cultural documents, in some case political documents, um, and also as a statement of presence. Right? I passed through this place, perhaps by myself, year after year after year after year, and I wish to leave my, my name, my hometown, um, and my purpose for being here on the tree. So oftentimes when you see these lists of dates, it's the same herder saying that he goes past this place every single, every single year. Um, and you can check out by theme, so we have theme of friendship, um, and then we have translated the, the inscriptions into, uh, translated into English, or vice versa, into Spanish. Uh, pride for home country or region of origin. So in Route County we found Peru, Mexico, Chile, Greece, and New Mexico principally as the pride for home country in terms of inscriptions. Uh, uh, religious devotion was a, a fairly significant quantity of the trees. I can't remember. Keelan Vargas, the cartographer, she's worked out all the percentages for me. She's a math major. I'm a, I'm a humanist, but it was something like 20% of the carvings that of our collection of like 300 were religious devotion. Aspen erotica gets a lot of press, but it's only like 17% or something. 
So it's not, it's not that bad. I do have to say that my pandemic human growth and development chat was unexpectedly due to the Aspen Archives project because I made my children like traipse through the forest for months. They don't want to know anything more <laughs> about the Aspen Archives. But I had to explain like, what, like what, what? You know, I had like a 10 year old and a six year old with me and they wanted to know more than I wanted to explain. Um, musical and cultural references, so they're actually song lyrics from Peruvian cumbias sometimes written on the tree. Um, a lot of discussion of Inca Cola. If, um, if you've uh, hiked the Inca Trail or gone to Machu Picchu, you've probably been offered this bubblegum flavored Peruvian soft drink, which there isn't any here <laughs> uh, in Route County. I haven't found it. Some aggressive and conflict laden messages. Um, and then you can check out on the website, we talk about this question of arboreal graffiti. Is it, a va is it vandalism? Is it an artifact? Um, I interviewed plant biologist uh, Dr. Julie Morris and she talks about um, the damage to the trees that a carving creates and how it is essentially a wound in the tree and the bacterial and fungal infections that result. And then um, my final tunnel, the question of the culturally modified tree and the question of wh what ways do humans mark the landscape for thousands of years in different parts of the world, marking trees specifically for different ways. Wayfinding, you know, um, indicating water sources, um, using the tree for medicines. So there's a whole sort of section there in the exhibit that talks about the ways that uh, humans have um, engaged with trees uh, for, for many, many different purposes. Um, and they're called by scientists culturally modified trees, or CMTs. Uh, <laughs> and there's a whole bibliography on the website, so if you want to read about culturally modified trees in Scandinavia, thousands of years of, of examples, very interesting. Australia, lot, uh, Patagonia, so there are many different parts of the world where you can find culturally modified trees and of course um, indigenous presence in Colorado, the Ute had a particular way of modifying their trees as well. And then I invite you to check out our wool processing and weaving section um, of the exhibit, a lot of historical uh, photographs of not only wool processing in northwest Colorado but also in Peru. My favorite section, Craig Wool Growers Sheep Shearing Contest from the 1940s. Amazing historic photographs, I thought. And then if you would like to contact um, the Aspen Archives Project with your own images, or if you want to decipher some of our mystery trees, um, they, you know, they, so there, there were several images that kept coming up, particularly in North Route County, that I was just like, what? Tell me, tell me what you think. Uh, and then, yeah, some, some, other, some other mystery trees that um, are in that section of the, his, of the online exhibit and also in the, in the tread of Pioneers Museum where you can um, let our project team know if you, if you know more about these trees. So that's it. Uh, if you wanna see some published works by other scholars about Aspen carvings, I have some books here that I brought with me. Check out the Woolly West, uh, Andrew Gulliford, if you're really interested in, the, in this history. And then you can just Google me. I'm Allison Krogel uh, from the University of Denver. That's it. Thank you. It depends in some case on the implement that the herder was using, but obviously the wider the wound, the older the carving. As I said, the cursive, that Spencerian script, tells you that we're probably talking about the 1930s, 40s, not later, probably than 55, if it's that really fine cursive. The language of the carving tells you something about um, 
whether or not it's a <laughs> yeah, high school kids, you know, uh, in the and uh, in the hometown, the vast majority of the sheep herder carvings. Well, you saw that there are many different themes, but um, unless it's Aspen erotica, it's usually signed as well with a hometown. So I think that's very interesting. The idea that it's not just me. I'm doing this for a purpose. The reason I'm doing this job is for my community and probably and probably for my family. So I think that that has something to do with the reason why folks uh, often put their home, indicate their hometown. And I have to say, um, in Quechua, in the language that a lot of these herders speak, who work in um, in Colorado and the Rocky Mountain West today, you don't present yourself by your first name when you're meeting someone new. You you say the town that you're from. Where's your home village? Where's your hometown? Then what family you come from, and then your personal name. Because at the end of the day, what's important? You know, do you want to know that I'm Allison, or do you want to know that I'm from the rugged Eastern Washington Idaho border? Like, what, what tells you more about me? Right, my my first name. So so that's interesting. But the fact that you're almost always indicating your hometown um, is something that you don't see so much with um, sort of arboreal graffiti tourist or, or just hiker um, inscriptions, I would say. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to answer questions for a few minutes here. I don't want to keep people, I know that there are more, many more things going on in Steamboat <laughs> tonight like this. Um, but I'm happy to answer individual questions or uh, take a couple of questions now. Yeah. Um, I, there's a, so the, if you look it up like on Google Maps, there's a Browns Park Nature Reserve, which is part of that historic um, region. It's kind of difficult to pinpoint what we call Browns Park, frankly. The borders of it shift. But if you look up that Browns Park Nature Reserve, I want to say it's called, is that right? Wildlife Refuge. That's the general area, and then it expands and contracts sort of with the, with the decades. Uh, but it's actually not an easy question to, to answer in terms of exactly where you cut that off. But you're basically talking about far north uh, west Colorado, south you know, Wyoming, and then far north east uh, Utah in that little area right there that receives significantly less. Uh, anyone a climatologist here? It's unbelievably like a little climate bubble there that receives significantly less precipitation, which makes it a great place to overwinter your flocks. Yeah. Anyone else want to ask a, a, whole, a whole group question? Yeah. Why do you think the bass were not as common here as you see like in southern Idaho? Yeah, or even the western slope. Yeah. So there's a whole other interesting question about Basque hotels and, um, you know, in, on the western slope. I think part of it just has to do with this, this area, you, you received your herders and your flocks later. It was a rougher place, just in general, settlement, European settlement was later here than other places. Um, a lot of it had to do, do with who you knew and you tend to go to where you have relatives. and. And there were a, a significant number of, of herders of Greek heritage already sort of in this area. So I don't have a good answer for that, but really, really early on, you have a large, large bass presence already in Northern California, and then spilling over into Nevada and Idaho. So that's sort of where you find your, your concentration. But I thought I was gonna find loads of carvings with Basque last names as I have found in other parts of the Rocky Mountain West, and it just doesn't seem to be the case. Maybe there's a pocket that someone can tell me about in Route County, but I can tell you around Crane Park, uh-uh. No, not around Crane Park, and my children can tell you also, not around, not around Crane Park. We spend a lot of time around in that area, um, that Elkhorn Stock driveway, and those last names are not, not Basque, yeah. And not really very many um, trees marked, you know, with Greek hometowns or Greece, a few, but it's mostly lots and lots of trees marked with Mexico, New Mexico, uh, and then Peru. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, 
for the uh, trails and pastures for the shepherds go today still uh, based on uh, carpenters 1934 plan oh good question um i oh yeah oh i'm sorry um so the question was are the grazing permits and the spaces where the flocks can be found today still similar to Carp the carpenters 1934s or grazing plan the way things were laid out i had a really hard time finding grazing maps <laughs> Um, when I have some contacts here in your local office of the U.S. Forest Service, and it was hard for me to find records of grazing maps through the through the years, right? Um, I'm sure that's something that that ranching families would have more access to than um, I would, but I I have a feeling that a lot of these are inherited and they're kept within the families. Um, yeah, if somebody has. Yeah. yeah. But in, excuse me, yeah. but if you look in uh, I'm going to give you this. <clears throat> but don't pull it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I can stand up. Okay. I think I can talk yeah. far enough that all of you can hear me. Yeah. <clears throat> if you look in the history of Route Dell National Forest, 1907 to uh, 1972, mm -hmm. Harry Carpenter, <clears throat> excuse me, Harry Radcliffe, uh, there's a letter in there, a very extensive letter, of when the first sheep came to Route County and how they arrived. Now, then they came from, <clears throat> excuse my voice, <clears throat> they came out of Wyoming, let me get they came out of Wyoming coming down with grazing permits that were on there in the high areas above where the, the black flies came in, where the horse flies were at. They grazed in trails coming across. They came down in 1912, and uh, he used the revenue he made primarily, he said, from ranchers, sheep men, in uh, Wyoming, uh, which was the uh, Cosker's brothers primarily. And he used that money, $5,000, to build the uh, road up over uh, Ravager's Pass. He is the first forester uh, supervisor here, and that is a detailed letter of how sheep came to this area. Oh, What's that? Did you say they came to rabbit ears? He no. built the road oh, over okay. rabbit ears pass, with them, and, and they came down all from. And what they were doing is they came out of Wyoming, up into the higher part of the area, and then they trailed one and then another herd, and then another herd behind each other as they went across. And he labels how they came and what they were doing. There is a photograph at, uh, over the tread of the pioneers where they brought sheep in and came into Route County, right down by where the library sat in 1912. And they loaded them out, which is the first bunch of sheep that came into this area. And of course, we have the rancher and cattleman war thing going on. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, but he explains the whole story of how it came. So it's on reserve, you know, the reserve section over there in the library. And this one you won't want to look up too well. Yeah, yeah. Is uh, <laughs> the history of Route County, 1907. That's the first time that the Route Forest was here because. It started Forster in 1905, but it was in 1907 over here to 1972, and then it's a 1948 letter, a long letter that Radcliffe will write. And he was the second superintendent. And last spring, you know, we had a talk here in this group about Radcliffe's uh, barn and the place up on uh, Mad Creek. It was the same man. And it's a very interesting thing. He talks about the Forest Service coming in and how he how to handle all of the problems with it there. Another one's with it. But uh, oh. sorry I'm talking too much. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, so it looks like this next slide just shortly after that, right? This, oh, this image that says it's at the, at the depot. Yeah. Yeah, but it's just a little bit, but those were from Rock Springs, yeah. Yeah? So with the age of these aspen trees, 
they don't live forever. Yeah. Any effort to preserve them or save them or document that, like, yeah, yeah. So um, if you listen to that interview with uh, Julie Morris, the plant biologist, she goes into great detail about depending on the altitude, the aspen will live, you know, a little bit longer than 100 years, 125, you know, depending. And um, and so yeah, we're we're really looking at if we're looking at inscriptions from 1925, it's right right there, getting near the end of that um, possibility. So. Um, if you all want to, to uh, work on this project, there's a, there's a project to create like um, um, an app on, the, on a phone where citizen scientists, uh, local um, history supporters could mark trees that they find that are particularly interesting, particularly old, <laughs> and where they are and mark them for, um, on this app so that they aren't removed. Uh, by the you know by by different <laughs> entities, um, but yeah, that's sort of an interesting ongoing project that um, I think some some local um, individuals are interested in pursuing. Um, but yeah, that's that's a problem in a lot of parts of, of the Rocky Mountain West. That um, you know, there's lot there are logging interests there, and then there's disease and then there's just the, the sheer, the age of the tree, right? So uh, this particular project, you know, has several hundred of the, of the Aspen uh, carvings documented. Um, and then there are efforts in Southern Colorado with some other documentation. Um, but yeah, climate change is also not helping Aspens, right? Uh, but yeah, it's probably about 125 year max. Sometimes I find, you know, really interesting inscriptions on the on the forest floor, right? Because the tree has already has already fallen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I probably should be not seeing this. When she's talking about, and as you all know, there's a tremendous amount of past in Rout County. Well, the Utes uh, as a way in order to improve their pastures, cause fires, and set fires. Well, in the late 1878-1879, uh, uh, they set several fires across Route County. Now, it causes a lot of controversy and so on with their new removal. But all of these aspen groves that you see are so much in Route County as a result of those fires. That's why you, we have so many, if you look at those uh, aspen groves, you can see the fire scar. You see how it moved, whether it's up here on the, just out of town or wherever they're at. So, and so you'll find that carving because it's a nice place to write. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an easy yeah. place to get to. Also, when you was talking about the location and how to locate Brown's Park, mm -hmm. See, originally that was known as Brown's Hole. Brown's Hole, yeah. And uh, they used the park. You see, whether it is it's, uh, Middle Park, South Park, North Park, Egeria Park, it's, it's been pretty well forgotten or what have you. It was known from the French word pot, pack, which meant that it is an enclosed area. So you take whatever the rim is, the high ground around that makes that circle. That is the park. That is the hole. And so when you look at Brown's Park, because it is protected with the even the mountains right there next to it and the rest of them, you have a, a very warm area. It was the area that uh, the Utes and the mountain men all in winter came. And it's if you want to know the size of it. Just look at the rim, mm -hmm. and that's where it's at. Yeah, and that's why they had so many violent skirmishes, right? Because you had all of those individuals wintering there together. Well, they really didn't. That area didn't have so many skirmishes outside of it. Uh -huh. But that was uh, the winter in a pretty sacred area, mm -hmm. where uh, you could go to it, you see the mountain men could go to it. The, here I'm talking again way too much, but the mountain men could go into it. You see the, 
uh, any of the Shoshones, the Ute, whatever they were, and you came there to winter, that's where you could do it. Now you could all fight somewhere else, and they did. But that was it, you see. Yeah. Now I'm trying to think of the date, but early on, there was a, a trapper that was wounded over North Park, and he shot himself in the leg. Well, they called him over to North Park, or to Brown's Park. He happened to be known by some of the youths. There was some youth women came and they spit on his leg and he became, they gave him a wooden leg afterwards. And he became Peg Leg Smith. Uh, and it wasn't really outlaw, fellas. But uh, it was a story where they came. So here, I'll shut up now. <laughs> no, thank you. Well, thank you all for coming, and no, no, yeah, but uh, let me know if you have any other questions, and come check out some um, other books <laughs> about uh, aspen carvings, and I hope you can see the exhibit uh, either online or in the museum. It should be there until May, I believe. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for coming.